This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so um, so we'll get started with um, our webinar today, and um, we're glad to have um, Matt Askin with us um, from GGS, um, and he's going to take us through um, some of the the benefits of um, continuous gas monitoring um, in particular, um, focusing on the Clear Technical Bulletin um, 18. Um, and I'll put a link to that in the in the chat in a minute. Um, so I'll just properly introduce Matt then. So um, he's a manager at GGS and he's a chartered scientist with over 15 years experience in the UK environmental sector. He's got a background in both regulatory and consultancy roles and has extensive skills in investigating and managing environmental challenges. Matt has a particular expertise in the investigation, monitoring, risk assessment and management of hazardous ground gases, the substantial knowledge of landfill, waste deposit and brownfield sectors. More recently, he's been focused on improving the environmental performance of the onshore um, oil and gas sector, specifically ways to reduce greenhouse gases and other associated emissions. Matt's also a long-standing um, fellow of the Geological Society and has served on a number of regional and specialist sub, um, group committees, um, including the Society's Environment Network. His keen interest in innovation and a proven track record of using new and repurposed technology to improve the environmental performance of activities both for clients and the wider society. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Matt, who I actually forgot that I had to make a presenter. <laughs> Again, <laughs> um, so hopefully you should be able to share your screen now, Matt. And somebody just give me a thumbs that's up. That that yep, that's yep, you. Stuff. Brilliant. Great stuff. Well, thank you for that um, introduction, Alison. Um, it's uh, it's great uh, to be able to present to the um, to the Conland Forum again, and, and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's also um, really uh, wonderful to see so many people are clearly still interested in. Um, ground gas as an issue. Um, I assume that's the, the topic and not the speaker which is driving that interest, but we'll, we'll see how we go. Um, so yeah, as, as you can see, um, I guess for those of you who were at um, Alex Statton's really interesting presentation um, a few weeks back, um, what I guess I'd like to do is to, to take the theme of that um, presentation and try to add some, some meat to the bones. Um, I think for those people who are um, experienced practitioners in, in gas risk assessment, the um, both the benefits and the limitations of GSV as a technique are, are well known, but I guess I'm, I'm, I'm less clear on um, how well understood they are in, in, in the wider sector. And so I guess um, today is, is really about looking at some of the, um, the shortcomings in GSV and, and I think when I say shortcomings, a lot of that might be about how it is actually um, put to practice um, rather than, than the, the, the technique or the methodology itself. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll start to look at what, um, what lines of evidence actually looks like in practice. And as I say, try and add some, um, some, some, um, some substance to that expression. Um, and hopefully, um, hopefully um, take some of the fear or dispel some of the myths that it has to be um, very complicated or very expensive and show you um, hopefully that a lot of the information we talk about when we when we speak of lines of evidence is information that is either already available within our projects or um, is, is easily gettable provided we plan and think about it up front. Um, so we'll, we'll get cracking um, and hopefully I'll, I'll be able to stick to time and um, yeah, we'll see how we go. So um, I guess, uh, as um, Alison will have mentioned, this is the, the first in a, a mini series um, on the, the topic of ground gas risk. Um, so hopefully both um, today and in, in Steve's session next week, um, you'll, you'll take the chance to kind of ask your questions and hopefully we can get some good discussion going. And, um, and anything we, we can't manage to deal with today, um, then obviously we'll have the, the opportunity to, to dive into a little bit more detail um, during the panel discussion in, in a few weeks' time, but do please um, do please contribute if you if you have a burning question. Um, so I just need to do a little bit of uh, screen management, um, as is common these days. Um, but let's let's get started. So um, 
I think we're all probably really quite familiar with some of the high profile um, instances and issues where um, ground gas hazards have have gone awry. So the the kind of the origin if, of the the discipline or the subdiscipline, if you will, was, was obviously LOSCO back in in 1986, a, a, a house um, explosion caused by um, migrating landfill gas, and it was obviously the um, one of the the early recognitions of the um, source pathway receptor relationship, um, and, and continues to form a, an important. Um, uh, foundation to um, the way we practice our science, um, even all these years later. Um, but as you can see from the, the Cranbourne incident in, in Australia, um, almost 10 years ago now, um, this is this is an issue not just in, in the UK. It's not just a, a legacy of, of our particular circumstances, but it's it's a, an issue that we we face around the world and in many um, many different settings. Um, and and one of the interesting things from that example um, is the fact that. Um, landfill gas in this instance and um, can be shown to to migrate over very substantial distances um, o over um, almost a kilometer in fact in in this particular example and then I guess closest to home um, and then most recently um, is the, the very unfortunate Gorebridge incident um, involving um, a mine gas hazard and um, uh, the, the kind of the, the acute human health impacts of um, uh, carbon dioxide ingress into properties um, and a really um, a really critical example or reminder of how um, the um, the nature of our proposed development and how we actually design engineer and construct our developments can have a real bearing on um, the ultimate or the actual ground gas hazard that is is faced by our our future um, receptors so um, it's it's important to bear that in mind um, and um, hopefully, um, with the increased attention and, and emphasis that ground gas issues are, are receiving at the moment, we'll be able, um, as a, a kind of professional community, we'll be able to um, uh, make sure that these instances um, aren't uh, aren't happening um, again in the future. So, starting with the the Losco instance, um, and, and particularly in the, the 10 or 15 years that followed. Um, Ground gas as, as an issue had um, a significant development of, um, of of guidance and best practice and, and British standards, um, and, and culminating in um, uh, Series C665, um, which is, is almost 15 years old now, um, and, and that continues to be a, a cornerstone of, of how we, we go about assessing risks um, from ground gases. And I, I will return to, to that as, as we go through the presentation. Um, but it's it's certainly not alone. Um, obviously, since 2012, um, with the advent of RB17, we've had um, the empirical approach to um, assessing TOC uh, for low and, and very low risk um, gas and sources. Um, the most recent version of, of the British standard in 2014. Um, additional um, uh, technical work um, via Claire on um, assessing and understanding and characterizing what worst case conditions look like in um, TB17 and um, uh, most laterally um, uh, TB18 um, which tries to bring together many of the strands and um, which had been touched on in, in earlier work and, and certainly in our our day-to-day -day practice um, and, and bring them together in, in one place and obviously there have been additional um, uh, additions to this um, to this timeline of guidance since, um, but I'm, I'm conscious that Steve will probably um, cover those in more detail in, in his session, so I, I will leave that timeline here for now. But suffice to say, um, there is no shortage of technical guidance and instruction and best practice available for us as uh, risk assessors and, and ground gas practitioners, um, and yet in practice, or certainly my impression is um, from the projects that, that kind of find their way across my desk is that the day-to-day -day practice of ground gas risk assessment hasn't actually um, evolved all that much in, in a great many cases. And um, as, as I'm sure you'll, you'll well know from, um, from the, the title of today's session and, and indeed from Alex's a, a couple of weeks back, um, the, the, grass, the gas screening value of the, the GSV approach uh, remains the cornerstone. <laughs> I'm just thinking Steve's comment, and he's, he's entirely right. Um, uh, 
so the, the GSV approach is, is kind of most commonly practiced. And I guess um, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, what we're talking about um, when we say GSV is that a, a single site-specific calculated value based on periodic monitoring results from boreholes um, and the, the outcome of that calculation implies a, a characteristic risk, risk situation which informs um, uh, what, if any, protective measures are, are needed. Um, it's calculated by taking um, the maximum observed concentration of, of each of the principal hazardous gases, methane and CO2, and multiplying that by the, the worst case borehole flow rate as measured. So that's, that's really quite simple, and, and I'm sure that's um, a, a large part of the reason why it's practiced so much and so perhaps so quickly and, and so um, unthinkingly. Um, but it's, um, it, it really is just a, a window. It's, it's a piece of the puzzle. It's a valuable piece of the puzzle. Um, and as Steve has, has commented, if you actually read the guidance and kind of follow and, and, and implement the guidance in your projects, it's um, it's very useful when used properly, but when used um, as a kind of simple simple turn the handle, spit out a number, reach a conclusion type approach, that's when then I think we think uh, we, we get into problems. And um, so I guess I want to um, to try and explore that idea a little bit and try and demystify and take some of the, the fear or the fear of cost and delay out of um, looking at a, a more comprehensive approach. And I guess the, the analogy I would use here is that GSV alone is like trying to complete um, a jigsaw puzzle with only the corner pieces. Um, they're important, they set the scene, but they don't give you the full picture. And it's only through lines of evidence and genuinely site-specific and detailed uh, conceptual site model development that we can start to get beyond the GSV number and, um, and look at what the actual level of, of risk is. So going back to first principles, um, unlike many contaminants or many contaminants or, or contaminated land problems, ground gas is, is seldom stable or predictable or the same from, from one day to, to the next. It can be affected by many, many things, um, uh, both naturally occurring and also about how we investigate and how we monitor. Um, and so for those people who are taking periodic monitoring readings or um, running GSV calculations and, and concluding risk and judgments on that basis, you really need to understand some of those influences um, and take account of them in um, both the design of your investigations, how you monitor and how you ultimately assess risk and, um, and make recommendations on that basis. Um, and, and I guess this is the, the point that maybe Steve's comment was driving at. And um, it's, I would say, not universally, but certainly very frequently overlooked that GSV was intended as a guideline value. It's not an absolute threshold. It's not um, kind of a, a, a biblical truth. It is a, a, an insight, a guidance into the, the type of gas hazard you might be facing. But it's certainly not the full story. Um, a lot of its value is in the fact that it's very widely recognized, it's uh, routinely accepted by regulators, um, but its it's true and full value is only realized when parts and um, when included as part of, of a detailed CSM, um, which is informed by and consistent with all the other lines of evidence available to us. Um, and there are um, obviously circumstances where you have a more complicated picture and, and there are techniques and tools which I'll, I'll touch on which can help you in those situations. Um, but the, 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 the fundamental point is that um, uh, for the, the more straightforward sites where something like GSV um, uh, can be used, it needs to be um, contextualized, site specific and consistent with the, the information that we have available to us. So to look at, I guess, uh, an example of, of what we mean when we say um, gas is, is seldom stable or, or predictable, um, here's a, a, a time series um, graph of uh, some continuous monitoring. Um, and we can see um, changing atmospheric pressure. We can see our three bulk gases, methane, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. And we can see um, periodic methane ingress. 
um, in, uh, in concert with um, uh, falls in, in atmospheric pressure. So if we think about this through the lens of GSV, um, it's a it's a value, as I've said, is, is that it's a simple, easy to do calculation based on observed gas concentrations and observed um, borehole flow rates. Um, but if you look at um, kind of the additional insight that continuous monitoring can give, you can see that um, no one set of values is, is truly representative, or sorry, I should say, no one set of periodic values is truly representative of the full range of behavior that's that's present in this example. Um, and if you happen to come along and take your periodic mon um, monitoring round on these occasions and on the green um, dates, um, you will get one picture. If you do the same exercise on the red dates, you will get a very different picture. No one set of results is right or wrong. They are um, elements of a, a much broader and more complicated picture. And it's important, I think, critical in the light of, of events like Gorebridge and, and similar that, that are maybe less well publicized, that we take account of the fact that um, ground gases behavior is variable um, and complicated. And it's only when we get that full picture, which takes account of, of that variability, that we can truly start to, to genuinely assess risk. So obviously, um, the, the cornerstone of, of any contaminated land um, investigation, and, and particularly relevant um, when looking at ground gas, um, is the um, conceptual site model. We, I know this is, is fundamental and it's familiar to, um, to, to, to probably all of us, um, but we still see a, a huge number of um, examples where um, uh, a, a very rudimentary um, or, or Kind of basic text-based version of a, a CSM has been developed and um, quite often that information is, is really generic um, and, and could be applied to, to many, many sites. Um, so because of the complexity and the variability of, of ground gas behaviour, we really need to get detailed, get site-specific and start to document our, our, our conceptual site models in a way which is both robust and defensible but also clearly communicates um, the, our, our, our developing understanding of the, the relationships between source pathway and receptor. And I guess bear in mind that um, good risk assessment obviously is, is, is always staged and iterative. Um, and I guess just to, to emphasize the point that GSV as a calculation alone it's just one stage in that process. It's not the be all and end all. And certainly if done um, with limited reference or completely detached from the, the site specific detail um, and, and a genuine understanding of, of what's driving that, um, those, those readings that we see, then it's, its value is, is, is quite limited. And, and we're kidding ourselves if we think we've got a, a proper handle on, on the circumstances. Um, so, um, each of those tiers of risk assessment and investigation um, can be informed by multiple lines of evidence. Um, in fact, they're massively enriched by doing so. Um, and as I said, my main aim for today really is to try and get across the fact that a lot of what we talk about when we talk about the lines of evidence approach is information which is either already readily available to us or can or should um, be gained or certainly considered um, in the design of, of our investigations. Um, lots of the information I'm going to talk about um, is around, it's, it's kind of disparately available as a project advances, but what we see time and time again is that the value or the, the, the relevance of a particular piece of information or a particular line of data isn't properly factored into how we um, uh, undertake our, our ground gas risk assessment um, and, and you know more often than not and certainly more often than we would like um, what you end up with is, is people carrying out a, a GSV calculation as, as, as kind of the be all and end all and, and the final warden in risk assessment um, and, and it certainly isn't. So what I plan to do through the next section of, of the, um, uh, the, the presentation is, is just to talk you through 
some of what we mean when um, we talk about multiple lines of evidence. Um, and hopefully as we go along, you will see that none of this is particularly new or revolutionary. Um, it's stuff that's out there and available to us and we're just not gaining um, the full value from it um, or certainly not in, in many of the um, uh, initial gas risk assessments that, that, that we see. I'll just take a quick swig before we move into the next section. Um, so uh, first and foremost, any, um, any uh, contaminated land investigation, watered salt, um, We'll be, we'll be following um, the LCRM procedures. It will be staged, it will be iterative, and it will start at, um, at the desk study stage where we start to um, characterize our site and what the potential um, sources of risk um, may well be. And th this is just an example of, of some of the sources of information that we have available to us that are um, relevant or potentially relevant to to ground gas, um, but obviously we have um, our underlying geology, maybe um, PD soils, maybe coal measures, um, maybe um, uh, maybe chalk could be relevant. Um, but that's the starting point. It's in virtually every report that I see, but the relevance and the context is seldom fully availed of. Um, so that's a, a really foundational piece of evidence that we can use. Obviously, um, the occurrence and extent of the, um, the coal mining legacy in, in the UK and, and also taking account of um, the age of, um, of potential mine walkings, if, if that's relevant to your project, um, starting to think about what might have been the mining practices um, and layouts and depths of, of mining activity at that point in time. Um, taking account of um, landfill and, and other artificial ground deposits and obviously not forgetting the um, the, the kind of often seen as the, the forgotten relative of the ground gas family thinking about um, radon and bearing in mind this is a, a useful source of um, initial information to to look to um, but this is a, a probability map not a concentration map and um, you can and do find um, radon at, at kind of actionable levels in all sorts of places and um, the map is a guide but it should certainly start to to inform our thinking if um, if your project happens to fall into to one of these higher risk areas there's many many more sources of, of information we could touch on here um, but th this really is foundational stuff um, and um, it's it strikes me in in lots of the phase one reports that I see is that it's it's documented almost in a, a perfunctory way we we capture the information because we have to it's expected but the the true value and relevance um, and the kind of the totality of that relevance is is seldom taken account of in in many of the gas risk assessments that we see um in a similar vein um, if we think about um, historical mapping and, and similarly um, historical aerial photography um, depending on where you are in, in the country or, or indeed in the world um, and depending on what the initial contextual information looks like the there may well be a huge amount of relevant value um, available by looking at um, historical maps um, through time and, and we're fortunate here that we have in many cases uh, well over 100 years worth of, of um, map iterations so that we can we can see um, sources and potential pathways and clues to what the, the ground gas um, uh, risk regime may start to look like simply by um, taking the time to, to look at our, our historical mapping. So in this, um, this particular example, we have, um, we have evidence of former colliery walkings. We have um, village names and place names, um, which may give us um, relevant information. In, in this case, we have pit lane next to, to the gravel hole village and um, which which kind of are giving us clues about geology but also potential gas sources we can see we've got um brick walks and um, which implies um a, a, a clay heavy um geology and um, but it also indicates that we may well have a void and um, which will at some point have been infilled and um, so that may well be a, a source that we need to think about but the point here is that there's a huge amount of information, particularly when looked at um, 
through time and, and actually identifying key features or relevant features and tracking their development through time to see what, if any, relevance or context that may well bring to our investigation as and when we get to that stage. We um, the next the next thing I, I would look to um, is um, and and still it's it's at early stages, but wherever possible, we really need to be actually getting um, our boots on the ground and, and our eyes on to try and gain um, additional context and information on our site, but also our site surroundings to see what relevance that may well have um, for our ultimate gas risk assessment, which obviously is is still some way down the the project pipeline at this stage but there are lots of clues that you you can see um just by getting out and about and actually seeing the sites that we're we're assessing so um vegetation um the the, the kind of nature and extent and, and mixture of vegetation and, and also its condition can be um can be a really helpful clue um landforms um uh, any um slope failure um evidence or, or or tension cracking um any erosion features which not only give you a, a sense of potential um, waste degradation, but also potentially useful information on what is the age and makeup of that waste. And, and obviously that has, has relevance um, to our ultimate level of, of gas risk in our, our future development. Um, we also um, may well see signs of um, uh, differential settlement, um, water accumulation, which tells you both about what's in the ground as well as, as, as the, the cover ground itself. Um, and if you're really lucky, we may well see evidence of historic gas management or um, gas venting, which which clearly raises um, raises key questions for us um, when we um, when we start to pull together um, our relevant lines of, of initial information. Um, and at these early stages of um, a project, even before um, we have dug a single pit or sunk a single borehole, we can start to build a really quite rich anticipated conceptual model. It doesn't need to be um, necessarily fancy or um, kind of in, in such a state that it, it, it's kind of ready for, for public sharing, but um, it, it's a really critical tool to help us start to scope our investigation and ultimately our risk assessment um, and also um, start to visualise and think about what source pathway relationships we might need to um, to use in the design of our, our subsequent investigation. So taking the time, even if, as I say, it's, it's in an, an informal or, or kind of non-presentable um, way to bring that information together, whether it be textually or graphically, um, is a really useful step. Um, not complicated, doesn't need to be time consuming, um, but it can add real value um, to the steps that follow. Um, we can uh, start to um, identify our potential sources, pathways and receptors uh, long before we've, we've actually um, broken ground for the first time. So, so these are the, the early stages and we've, you know, we, we've done little more than a, a phase one um, study and perhaps a, a site visit at this stage. Costs are low, time scales are pretty quick, but already we have a very rich um, and, and relatively detailed picture, which will help us um, direct um, and indeed design our, our investigation to follow. Um, so as we, we move forward and we start to think about what that design might include, um, quite often, and I, I, I mean, it'll be interesting to hear um, some more experiences from, from the, the community, but Quite often with, with projects that, that I see, um, a lot of this information was available, um, but uh, for whatever reason, and, and quite often I, I think the relative ease and simplicity of, of how GSV is, is used or perhaps misused, um, the, the value of that information is lost, um, or rather the opportunity to, to kind of build that value into your project has, has been lost. Um, and, and so we, we kind of end up in a loop and have to, to repeat things or, or redirect things that could have been built in from the outset. Um, but I guess I want, as we, we kind of move into um, our, our phase two walk and our, our actual investigation and, and monitoring effort, 
I guess I want to think about things other than simply digging um, trial pits and, and sinking boreholes and, and installing monitoring wells. They remain crucial and and um, and you'll see that I, I include them in 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 our thinking and, and certainly in this presentation. Um, but they are they should be thought about um, how they're located, depths and um, spread. Um, the type of logging and supervision we do, all of that um, should be thought about before we actually get to um, the site investigation stage because there is value to our gas risk assessment um, at that stage. And if if you only look to that value after the fact, then you know your, your project will in, incur additional cost um, or additional delay if your kind of reliance on GSV doesn't give you the outcome you you want or expect. So, um, I guess one of the things I'm, I'm quite keen to talk about, and I'm conscious that, again, um, Steve may well um, go into to more detail on, on this next week, so I, I won't dwell on this too much, other than to say, to take the theme of, of today's presentation, moving beyond GSV, GSV is a really useful, as I've said, as a, an indication, as a guideline value. Um, but it, it comes from boreholes and boreholes can and, and regularly do influence the results we see. And they may, in lots and lots of circumstances, they may alter or indeed um, uh, overstate the level of risk to potential future development because they are an artificial intervention in, in the ground gas regime. We're, we're essentially putting a, a free flowing chimney into the ground. So we're seeing um, probably um, gases at levels or, or flow rates which are not genuinely representative of, of the site at large. And so supplementing those things that you do commonly and routinely with things like um, detailed uh, emission mapping surveys, and you don't have to present them in this way, but doing the activity and gaining the data and, and where possible doing it on uh, more than one occasion so that we can capture different environmental conditions can give us a really rich um, additional line of evidence to help inform um, the genuine um, level of, of ground gas flux that we might be facing and therefore our, um, our future developments uh, may experience. Um, and it, it's a, a, an old and long established um, uh, technique, but um, the, the use of flux boxes um, to start to quantify and control our measurement of, of surface emissions and surface gas fluxes um, can be really important. And, and both of these techniques, you, you can use them in isolation or, or together, um, but they add a, a kind of a, a reality check, but they also allow us to add significant spatial coverage at relatively low cost compared to, to borehole-based monitoring techniques. Um, now, I said I wasn't kind of throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater. Um, there is absolutely still significant value in um, trial pitting and, and indeed boreholes, as we'll see. Um, but quite often, um, very limited, if any, consideration of the, um, the end gas risk assessment has been given when our trial pits are, are being put in. Um, there used on lots and lots and lots of projects and um, comparatively quick and cheap to carry out um, and very often gas is is either not foremost in, in the mind of the people supervising these works um, or indeed maybe the, the competence or the awareness isn't there but again we can have um, a significant additional spatial coverage we can actually get eyes on on the the ground conditions and also the variability the ground conditions both vertically and horizontally um, through the use of trial pitting um, but also through um, a good old-fashioned forensic description of, of the arisings and, and indeed this, the, um, the, the strata encountered um, can provide really useful contextual information on the age and makeup of any on-site gas sources that you may be dealing with um, so that's it's it's basic um, but it's quite often overlooked, or rather its full value is overlooked. Um, and so I'd, I'd encourage people to um, stop and think about um, the, the potential extra value you can get from your trial pitting where, you, where you're doing it. 
Um, as I've touched on already, um, for those sites where um, off-site migration isn't considered a, a credible pathway and the, um, uh, the, the gas risk based on our phase one walk is considered low or very low, the empirical approach using um, lab-based testing of, of organic content is available. And provided you, you understand the, um, the, the limitations and the applicability of this method, this can be a really useful approach in, in lower risk settings. Um, but you, you do need to, to know what you're working with and, and, and you know, take account of the fact that um, uh, in the right circumstances, um, the degradation of organic content may not proceed at the, the rate you would think or expect. And this is a, a neat little example we, we use of a, a magazine we pulled from a, a, a pit um, on a project some years back. But um, th this magazine had been in the ground 50 years and, and still um, still retained significant and recognisable um, organic carbon, which, um, if, if um, present in sufficient volume, would um, potentially um, be a, a relevant thing uh, in in a, an approach using um, RB17. So definitely be aware of it, avail of it where appropriate, but know its limitations and, and kind of keep your, um, your 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 kind of thinking hats on. Um, as, as you progress through that investigation. Um, obviously, in, in any discussion of GSV, um, boreholes and, and monitoring installations um, um, uh, remain central to, 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 to this discussion. Um, as I've said, I have no issue with GSV on its own. Um, it's quite often the application or the simplistic application of GSV that is, is problematic. So. Um, take full advantage of what investigation you are doing. And um, once you've got a, a, a borehole drilled, um, an installation is a, a very quick, quick and cheap addition. Um, and so I, I would encourage you to, to take advantage of that, that opportunity where you have it. Um, but if you're going to do that, make sure you do it in a way um, which, which will actually add value rather than introduce uncertainty to your, um, to your ultimate risk assessment. So design your um, response zones in relation to, to um, uh, groundwater conditions at the site and also um, where you have potentially multiple relevant strata or multiple sources that you're investigated. Don't just sink a hole and screen it from, from base to ground um, level. Um, you're missing opportunities to get real insight which can provide multiple independent lines of evidence um, from something which, which we do on virtually every project. Um, and obviously, if, if we're interested in, um, in uh, um, uh, a GSV approach and, and periodic monitoring, we need to make sure that, um, excuse me, that um, our monitoring wells have a, a, an adequate and, and competent seal um, so that what we're measuring is, is genuinely ground gas and, and not atmosphere by another route. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess what we're, we're looking to avoid is, is examples such as this, where we have um, screen section above ground or screen section at ground level, um, or indeed um, plain section across the full depth, or screen section across multiple relevant horizons. A lot of this stuff is very simple and easy to look after, provided the person supervising or designing um, is competent and, and knows what they're doing. Um, and um, as I say, um, if if you're relying on GSV and the quality of your installation isn't up to scratch, then then you're, you're fooling yourself and, and you're fooling your clients too. And sooner or later, um, you may well come unstuck. Um, obviously, um, in any discussion of GSV, we have to talk about periodic monitoring. Um, at its most basic, we look at um, uh, concentrations across a, a site. Um, it's important to look at um, the full range of, of gases that we might be interested in and, um, and obviously flow rates, um, but also think about um, the other contextual information that can bring value and additional um, confounding or, or um, contrasting evidence to, to this line of evidence. So, take account of weather conditions, take account of um, the prevailing pressure regime both at the time but also before and after, 
um, and keep your eyes open and, and your note keeping um, up to scratch um, uh, so that you gain maximum value um, for, from this, um, this line of evidence, which, as I say, is, is present on virtually every project. Um, but it's also important to um, look at periodic monitoring, not just relying on peak or steady state values, but actually looking at how those results develop over time. Um, so um, seeing whether a flow rate is, is um, sustained and representative or an artifact of, of the, the local geology or indeed the, the preceding weather conditions, um, whether or not the, the well is flooded or the surrounding ground is flooded. There's lots and lots of extra information which can bring clues and context and evidence to our periodic monitoring if only we take the time to capture them um, routinely and clearly in the field and then pay attention to the notes that we've taken. So, um, time for another drink, I think. So, that's a, 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 a kind of a, a whistle-stop tour through many of, of the kind of the key lines of evidence that are available to us. As I say, very little in here is new or revolutionary, um, but doing it right and doing it comprehensively can really add um, substance and robustness and reliability um, and trust to the risk assessments that we undertake. So it's really important that we, we take the time to do that right. Um, I guess it's it's not um, strictly speaking um, relevant to the initial investigation phase, um, but where you um, where you have uh, pre-existing development and you're trying to retrospectively understand um, what level of risk, line, multiple lines of evidence as a technique can be um, can be undertaken in these settings as well. So um, you can whichever line of monitoring or whichever type of technique of monitoring you choose to use, um, we can um, execute that both in the source, the pathway and at the receptor while taking account of environmental um, drivers and, and variability and um, start to build a, a rich pic picture of actual real world risk um, uh, uh, even when your, your development is, is pre-existing. And, and we're seeing quite a few of, of those at, at the moment for, for one reason and another. Um, and indeed, um, undertaking detailed um, additional uh, techniques um, when you're looking at uh, pre-existing um, uh, development and, and, and you're dealing with a, a risk which is either realized or, or suspected to be realized. There are, uh, again, different techniques available doesn't need to be particularly expensive, doesn't need to be particularly complicated, but they can add um, temporal um, richness or spatial richness or increased confidence um, to the results um, and the lines of evidence that we gather. Um, so, 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 so these techniques are available um, and, and should certainly be considered where you, you think you have uh, an existing development which, which may have a, a problem on, on its hands. So, um, as I said, I've covered um, at, at quite a pace a range of different monitoring techniques, sampling techniques, investigation techniques. Nothing probably in there that you, you haven't seen before, but it's when they are taken together um, that they can bring real context and richness to the risk assessment that you subsequently carry out. Um, so, I, I really encourage you to. Um, make full use of, of the lines of evidence um, that are available to you. It doesn't need to be scary and it doesn't need to uh, cost the earth or, or delay things, provided you think about it um, up front. So once we've, um, we've gathered all of that data, um, the opportunity for um, analysis and interpretation increases, um, depending on which uh, methods of investigation you've used. Um, we can look at um, relationships with environmental drivers and, and correlations. We can look at the repeatability and the consistency of those relationships. Um, we can do um, additional um, uh, interpretation and interrogation of, of the data we've collected and look um, at how our observed data corresponds to what we might expect based on our, our developing understanding 
of what might be driving gas risk at a at a site. Um, so um, this is again, this is this is not new, um, but it's it just serves as a reminder to take account of those um, those critical um, main environmental correlations, which are common drivers of ground gas risk. Obviously, atmospheric pressure, and um, where possible, take account of of any um, measured difference between atmospheric pressure and, and borehole pressure, whether that be by periodic monitoring or continuous monitoring or or other techniques, and um, because that can give you clues as to, to what's going on. Um, and obviously, where we're dealing with perhaps vapor issues and, and hydrocarbons, temperature um, may well be a, a driving factor. So make sure you're, you're measuring for those things when you are undertaking your site visits um, and also uh, taking um, regular, reliable and accurate readings of, of groundwater level. Um, uh, all of these things provide um, rich environmental context to uh, whether it be your, your periodic monitoring results or your continuous monitoring, um, which can add confidence and strengthen our conclusions or indeed it can um, confound um, our, the understanding we think we have and prompt us um, to, to, uh, to look a little deeper. Um, and when we consider these correlations and these potential drivers, where you have, um, where you have drivers which show clear association and correlation with gas behavior, and we can carry those forward as, as things worthy of um, for the consideration, but where it's quite apparent that there's no relationship between one um, drop potential driving factor and the gas conditions that we see on site, those can be um, safely eliminated, provided you um, justify your reasoning and document that justification as part of your, your risk assessments. Um, quick um, talk about uh, the groundwater ground gas interaction. Um, as many of you will know, um, carbon dioxide and methane are, are two most common um, ground gases of concern, and, and certainly from a GSV point of view, interact with groundwater very differently. Um, and those differences, um, they can drive real important and substantial changes in um, the monitoring results that we might subsequently take from, from a site where um, significant uh, quantities of dissolved gas may be an issue, and therefore we need to we need to be mindful of that. We need to understand that, and where we think it's a a significant contributing factor to our our, our overall picture, taking the the slight extra cost to actually have a, a lab analyze um, what level of dissolved gas you might have, um, and also looking at where. Um, how that um, gas is behaving and how it's corresponding to different models of, of diffusion. Um, that can be a, a really interesting and, and, and insightful um, additional technique that you can you can undertake. Um, and it's 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 useful to to kind of remind you really just that um, particularly when thinking about methane, which obviously doesn't want to be in water particularly, it requires very, very low levels of um, dissolved gas, relatively speaking, in order to give rise to wash and um, could be considered um, uh, concerning or um, uh, gas concentrations which drive us or, or, or kind of prompt us to, to um, operate our risk assessment if, if we're solely walking on, on GSV. So take the time and, and effort to, to understand where your groundwater is, what it's doing, how it's contributing um, to the overall picture. Um, and, uh, and and be mindful of, of of the effect of that on GSV um, if if that is the, the the kind of the risk assessment technique you, you ultimately rely on. Um, so I guess um, just to to kind of speed things along a little bit, um, I mentioned earlier on that GSV driven by gas concentration and measured flow rate. Um, both of those things can be um, uh, influenced and, 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 and kind of overstated or indeed understated by changes in, um, in differential pressure and, and how that affects um, periodic monitoring um, and also how we record the results of our periodic monitoring. If you're not um, sufficiently experienced or trained or just aware of how, um, how this can interact with periodic monitoring results, um, we can 
end up recording significant positive flow rates or significantly elevated concentrations which are not genuinely representative of, of the risks that our, our potential development faces. Um, so um, measuring that, being aware of that and taking account of that in, in your risk judgments later on um, can be really, really important. And obviously these are um, examples of scenarios where um, uh, flow, which you, you will measure during your, your periodic monitoring, um, will be present, but it's not necessarily speaking directly to your, your real level of, of ground gas risk. So, so you need to be aware of that. Um, so um, obviously in, in recent years we, we have, through a range of techniques, we have um, the availability to contemporaneously monitor both components of the GSV um, calculation at the same time. Um, so this allows us to, to, to look at what, if any, relationship there is between our observed gas concentrations and our observed flow rates. Um, we can um, look at what um, the, G, the evolving GSV um, calculation might look like over time and also start to understand um, if we have a site which is, is on the margins of, of one classification or another, look at what is, is kind of more representative of um, of the the actual on-site conditions and how that might inform um, our, our ultimate conclusion of, of risk. Um, if you are employing continuous monitoring, um, actually taking the time to look at the atmospheric pressure regime that you've you've encountered. Um, this is something that we we do quite routinely. We we actually uh, analyse and, and map. The, um, the range of atmospheric conditions that we, we see and we can start to um, conclude and also communicate more clearly um, the, whether or not the, the, the monitoring results on which we're basing our risk assessment actually meet or approach uh, worst case conditions or not. And so that can be a, a really helpful thing to certainly consider and, and where relevant to, to include in, in your risk assessment. Um, and if I, I skip along a little bit, um, um, a quick word about um, modelling. Um, there are circumstances um, where modelling techniques and and um, and similar uh, quant semi-quantified uh, quantitative uh, techniques are useful. Um, where you are in a, a situation where you're relying on modelling techniques. Um, it's important that you understand the, the limitations and the input parameters and, and the interrelationship between the different elements of, of your monitor, uh, your model, excuse me, um, and, and make sure, I guess, um, uh, where you are using a modeling technique or if you're relying um, on a, a modeling conclusion that your model stands up to, to kind of um, real world sense checking and you're not kind of swapping one um, kind of simple, um, uh, one simple calculated uh, tone to handle type approach um, in GSV for another. Um, I guess the temptation um, for a quick and simple and unambiguous answer to the, the question of, of ground gas is, is very tempting. I, I can totally get that. Um, but if, if you're drawn into just going with the calculations or just going with model conclusions without thinking about that wider context, then, then again, you're, you're likely to come unstuck um, sooner or later. And as I say, um, when you do get into more complicated um, or uh, more ambiguous settings, there are additional um, uh, iterative um, techniques that you can, you can use um, to look at and probability and, and likelihood of, of a risk being realised. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious that time is ticking on, so I, I guess I want to try and convey that hopefully a lot of what I've um, covered today is, is not new, it's not unfamiliar, um, but most of the um, gas risk assessments that we see on a regular basis haven't availed of the full value of all of the information um, that was available within a project. So if you or, or on your client's behalf, you're going to the trouble of paying for all of this work and gathering this information, then make sure you're making best use of it and that you're building the, um, uh, 
the results and the findings of those independent lines of evidence into your um, revised CSM as it um, as it develops. Um, so, uh, in quick summation: when we talk about lines of evidence um, as a, an alternative or a supplement rather to GSV, and um, doesn't need to be frightening. All it means simply is taking full account of multiple different lines of of, of evidence gathering. Consider each of them um, on their own and um, start to bring them together and assess whether or not they're telling a compelling story which points to a, a single and clear outcome or whether or not there is there's ambiguity um, remaining. Um, use the conclusion of that um, assessment to inform and um, contextualize your both your CSM and your GSV calculation and take account of the, the relative weight of, of the relative strengths of, of each line of evidence. Um, and, and you can do this in a, a, a qualitative or a quantitative sense, um, but I'll, I'll give an example based on, on spatial coverage. Um, for large um, developments um, with only a small number of data points, we would have relatively little confidence or relatively low level of confidence in results um, deriving from that. But as the richness of that data and that evidence um, starts to build, whether it be um, spatial coverage or temporal coverage or consistency of results, um, we can start to um, assign higher levels of, of confidence and reduce levels of uncertainty to our conclusions. Um, quick check on time. So we're, we're just about one o'clock. So what I'll do is, um, I guess, one point I'll, I'll, I had a, an example, um, which I'll, I'll just move on because there is is one point that I, I guess I wanted to um, to really cover. Um, GSV, as I say, as a technique, it's perfectly sound, but you need to understand the vast range of things which can influence and, and regularly does influence um, what those two numbers are, what they mean, where they come from, and what they're actually telling you about your site and, and the potential future ground gas risk. And I guess the, the last thing I, I wanted to, to mention, two, two things really. Um, a lot of this I notice is, is, is no longer new, but a lot of what I've spoken about is, is covered in, in more detail and more comprehensively in TB18 and indeed in later publications. So I'd encourage you to, to take the time at some stage to, to walk through that and, and try to build in some of that learning, some of those techniques into your, your risk assessments. Um, and then I guess where I wanted to finish um, was to, to look at this. The, the two challenges I, I most commonly get when we talk about um, using multiple lines of evidence rather than just doing some GSV is it will take longer and it will cost more. Um, if thought about um, at the earlier stages of a project, if we build in the need for a richer, more robust um, multiple lines of evidence risk assessment at the early stage of our projects, if we're thinking about this at the desk study stage and as we design our, our ground investigation and our monitoring well installation, you can, um, you can build up um, a much, much richer, more representative, more detailed um, picture of ground gas conditions and, and therefore risk at your site in exactly um, the same amount of time provided you think about it early on. Um, it doesn't need to be something which takes months and months. Um, and then of course, um, is it going to cost more? Well, it can do um, and certainly the most common case I see is where you end up having to do multiple lines of evidence having already done a GSV alone. Um, based um, assessment. Um, but if you build this stuff into um, your thinking and your design at the outset, um, you can actually reduce the, the number of site visits and the, the amount of travel and the amount of time and therefore the amount of cost that's involved. Um, and um, more so than, than ever before, um, when deploying um, these techniques, um, you can do so competitively with um, simply using a, a GSV approach based on, on periodic monitoring alone for, if not the same cost, for similar or com comparable cost. Um, and so 
I think we're moving beyond the point at which cost alone is, is a reason not to do something more robust, more representative, and more insightful. And the, the net effect of more and more of us doing, um, undertaking a, a multiple lines of evidence approach is that we will have more robust risk assessment um, and the potential to actually save money in our clients' projects um, rather than cost them more is, is very real and I, I look forward to hopefully seeing that in future. Um, this will require kind of um, uh, kind of courage, uh, the courage of our convictions on, on behalf of both regulators and consultants alike, um, but it certainly has the potential to um, develop, de deliver better wet gas risk assessments for our projects, ultimately better projects, um, and that's, uh, that's in everybody's interest. So apologies for the inevitable overrun. Um, if there is anybody still left, I'm more than happy to, to answer any questions that remain. Um, and, uh, and, and any discussion points that people may have. Thank you, Matt. Um, Thank yeah, you, we Matt. Are, um, yeah, we are over a wee bit. Um, a just, bit. Um, just um, I think one thing that's come through quite thing. strongly um, in both you and Alex's presentation, I think, um, is to go back to basics and engage your brain mm. <laughs> and don't just go down Absolutely. the GSM rabbit hole. Um, uh, so uh, just a reminder, a... just before I stop the recording, that uh, we have our next one um, in this mini -se gas mini series, um, which will be next Thursday, which is the 27th of May by Steve Wilson. And then that will be followed a couple of weeks after with a panel session on the 10th of June. So look at the sclaf.co.uk website and you'll be able to get in there.